So last Sunday, I accidentally skipped over an illustration that I wanted to put in my homily, and I was bummed because I thought that it was funny, and then I told Julie about it later, and she did not think it was funny. So you were spared um, from something that wasn't funny. It, it wasn't the last time, or the first time, and it won't be the last time that I put something unfunny or messed up a delivery of a joke in a uh, homily. My friend Phil Owen and I were talking recently, uh, just this past week, about a time when we were doing video church, and I tried to make a joke at his expense, and I botched the delivery, particularly the punchline, so badly that it didn't come across as funny at all, um, and it, made it mainly just made him look like a terrible person, and it's funny now, but um, at the time, it really wasn't that funny, because I had to like apologize to him and everybody else at the same time. It was so bad, um, so it won't be the last time that my, uh, one of my jokes doesn't work, but... Uh, The illustration that I wanted to use last week, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the illustration I wanted to use last week was from the movie The Banshees of Inner Sheeran, which is, I think, one of the funniest and saddest movies I've ever seen at the same time. Um, It was my favorite movie from last year. I think it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, And the theme of the movie, the theme of the film, in case you don't uh, get around to seeing it, which would be fine, but I think you should, um, is relationships. Friendships, most specifically, and and how relationships can turn, um, take a turn that we don't expect, and what we can do in that situation. And it's about the durability of relationships. And the text that we're going to be in today is about the same thing, the durability of relationships. It's an important theme, as I feel as though our relationships have been somewhat strained and have found themselves in sort of difficult terrain over the last couple of years, especially. I feel like our society is sort of set up in such a way that our relationships are under a particular and considerable amount of duress and difficulty. And the text that we have today deals with exactly that. Today we're going to cover a lot of ground, both in terms of uh, the, the uh, teaching text itself, like is being, is really long, it's over 30 verses, but also the scope um, and the topics that are covered within that text um, I'm telling you that because this is unusual. Usually we don't go longer than 20 minutes for a homily, and I'm unusually going over today, most likely. There's like two of you who are excited about that, and the rest of you are like, this is why I go to this church, is because the homilies are really short. So I'm really sorry, and I promise I'm not going to do this very often. <coughs> Our kids' staff has been notified, so if you're a parent, and you're like, my kids, they're, they're okay, and so are the kids' staff. Everybody knows. Um, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, right now in a series throughout the season of Epiphany. And the Sermon on the Mount covers a tremendous amount of ground. Last week I went through the list of all the things that Jesus covers. Um, but even this, the text that we have today to finish out chapter 5 covers a whole lot of information. It, in the beginning of this series, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we cover the preamble, which we call the Beatitudes, where Jesus extends blessing or favor for those who are in pain in some way. And then he zooms in on those that he calls, that, that he calls disciples, not just the 12, not just the most ardent or perfect or certain followers of Jesus, uh, but really those who are curious enough to keep coming back for more. And so if you've counted yourself out as a disciple of Jesus because you're deconstructing or trying to figure out your way in faith, know that I have not counted you out. If you continue to show up or continue to watch this on YouTube or whatever it is you do, however it is you interact with this, you're not counted out. The disciples there at that time, at that moment, knew very little about this person. But they were willing to show up and to keep asking questions, to keep learning more. They were curious enough to continue to be there. And last week we talked a little bit about that expansive term, disciple, which includes all of us. This particular homily gets into the rest of chapter 5, wherein Jesus covers, again, a tremendous amount of ground. And like I said, it is all about relationships. We're going to go back in time and talk about the Torah. We're going to go back in time and talk a little bit from the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. We're going to go forward in time from the Sermon on the Mount and talk a little bit about something that happens later on in the same gospel. We're going to cover, like I said, a lot of ground. But my hope is that at the end of this, you will be able to answer this question with at least one idea, maybe a couple. What does Jesus expect from my relationships? What does Jesus expect from my relationships? Well, The reason why that's an important question is because Jesus raises the bar on relationships. Jesus doesn't make relationships, doesn't let us off the hook and make relationships something that is maybe easier to navigate or more simple. Rather, relationships become actually more complex, more challenging at least to navigate under the teaching of Jesus. This is in some ways a difficult teaching from Jesus and yet an extremely important one at the same time. 
So after the salt and light teaching where Jesus talks about the law, or after that salt and light teaching, Jesus talks about the law and how he is there not to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill the law. This is a classic transcend and include paradigm that has been popularized in philosophical meta theories like spiral dynamics and integral theory in modernity. In short, Jesus is explaining that law, morality, theology, philosophy, ethics, and more expand and develop over time. We are tempted to move on to a new stage of human development and leave the, leave the old behind as if it never existed, or maybe with resentment about the past, but in reality, the healthiest and most natural progression is to transcend and to include. If you're like me, this happens in the form of looking back at your, maybe your youth, the way that you followed the way of Jesus in your youth, and maybe you went through a process or a time, a stage in that period um, of your life where, that you're not so proud of. You look back on the way that you believed or the way that you thought or the way that you interacted with other people and you go, gosh, I really wish I wouldn't have seen it that way. But as long as there was no harm caused to others or harm caused to yourself, we can develop a sense of gratitude for that because that had a place in your life at a particular time for a particular reason. And the healthiest way for us to progress is, uh, as a species is to transcend and to include, to include that as a part of our story. That's who we were, That's who, and this is who we are becoming. Jesus does exactly this with the Mosaic Law in the Sermon on the Night. He takes the Mosaic Law and he transcends and includes. He includes the entire law, doesn't get rid of it, but rather transcends it and expands upon it. In verses 21 through 26, we see something about murder and anger. And you might be thinking, well, how does that have anything to do with relationships? What does murder have to do with relationships? Well, Jesus expands this idea to be about how we relate to others. In 27 through 32, we see something about marriage, adultery, and divorce. In 33 through 37, uh, we see something about promises and integrity. In 38 through 48, we see something about enemies and antagonists. In each of these examples, Jesus is raising the bar for relationships. Relationships have more to them than that. They require more from us than we had previously thought. And each of these sections begins with the exact same phrase, the paradigm or the pattern that is followed goes like this. You've heard it said blank, but I say blank. You've heard it said this way in the Mosaic Law, but I say it this way. It doesn't exclude or abolish or get rid of the original way, but it expands upon, it transcends and includes. It creates a reinterpretation of an old law. In blank one, Jesus refers to part of the Mosaic Law. In blank two, Jesus transcends it, includes it, and creates a something that fits a modern context. So let's go all the way back to the Mosaic Law for just a minute. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can. There's a lot of ground that we could cover here. The Mosaic Law is referred to as the Torah, which just simply means law in, in the Hebrew language. And I think that understanding the context in which the people of God received the law helps us understand what it actually did. Like, what was the purpose of the law itself? Well, at that time, the people of God were wandering. Literally, they were aimless in every sense of the term. When we use the term aimlessness, or we would describe ourselves as being aimless, it's something along the lines of like, I'm not sure what I want to do for my career. I'm not so sure how I want to proceed with this particular coworker. I'm not sure exactly what my calling in life is. In this case, they were aimless literally and figuratively up and down the line. They were literally wandering through the wilderness. They had no law to govern them. They, govern them. they had just come out of slavery for hundreds of years. Their identity had been wrapped up in the Egyptian identity, the Egyptian culture. And so here they are on their own for the first time, and they have nothing to govern them. If you're in a foreign country right now, you fall under the law, the constitution, or whatever they call it in that particular country, th and you have to abide by those rules and laws. That's, that's part of a civilized society. And, and our world is, 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 every country you go to would have some sort of law that you would, you would um, enact or you would act under. But in this particular sense, there was no law of the land. It was no man's land. They were wandering in the wilderness and they had no law to follow. There was no constitution for them to consider. There were no lawmakers debating a bill on the floor of Congress. There was no executive branch to sign that bill into law. There were no judges yet to interpret whether or not somebody was following the law appropriately or not. They had nothing. And so God gives them the Torah, which consists of s over 600 parts, many of which we read today and we go, what? The original law is wild and bizarre to us because we're like, this has nothing to do with us. And it's difficult for biblical literists or people who are trying to navigate the Bible in the most literal way possible because they're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this law about fabrics. I'm not sure what to do with this law about eating certain animals or not. I'm not sure what to do with this law about agriculture, you know? 
but they needed every bit of it because they needed to learn how to interact with each other. They needed to learn how to interact with God. They needed to learn how to interact with the land, literally. They had to learn how to do that, and the law gave them all of that. It was a great gift to them. And eventually, that law gets reinterpreted for a new generation. In Exodus, it exists in its kind of original form, and then it gets reinterpreted in the book of Deuteronomy for a new generation that knew nothing but wandering and aimlessness, and Moses gives them the law plus. It's like law, but also some, here's some new ideas. Here's some new concepts and ideas on this law. It's a reinterpretation of the old law. Moses isn't going rogue and talking about something that God had not given him. He's talking about something that they needed to hear, but it was, it was appropriate for a particular modern context. These things are extremely important for knowing how to live. So in our, in our family, we have a set of family values, the Hoag family values. Hopefully the kids could tell you this. We talk to them about it all the time. Um, but the Hoag family values are strength, courage, gentleness, and generosity. These are the Hoag family values. We've been praying these over our kids at night uh, for their entire lives. We've been whispering these things in their ear when we send them off to school. These are things that we write to them in notes when we write to them. These are four values that we talk about all the time. And in addition to being important for us knowing kind of like how to navigate life, they're also important for us to hold each other accountable. So instead of just arbitrarily being like, you did the wrong thing and now you need to apologize for it and there's a consequence, I can say, hey, when you decided you weren't going to share that thing with your brother or your sister, you violated this family value that we all agreed on of generosity. And so let's talk about how to be more in line with this particular value. Likewise, they can hold me accountable. If I discipline them in a way that's more aggressive or abrupt or I raise my voice or I, I kind of move them in a direction too quickly or too abruptly, I, I didn't practice gentleness. And they could call me on it. And they know that they have the right to do that. And what's more is I could call myself on it and come to them and apologize and say, you know what, I was thinking back on the way I did that. That wasn't gentle at all. That's a family value that I violated. These rules, these laws help us know how to navigate life. And they need to be reinterpreted time and time again so that they fit a modern context. That's what happens in the book of Deuteronomy. It's what, hap what, it's what happens in the book of Deuteronomy, and then it happens a few other times throughout the time that stretches um, uh, across the course of Scripture. Best I can tell, there are four particular times this, the law comes to the people or is interpreted for the people. The first is in the book of Exodus. Um, this required interpretation and debate to carry out, even though it was the first time. People couldn't take it at face value because there was a whole bunch of Hebrew turns of phrase that were used in the original law. I don't know if you know this, but the Hebrew language is as much art as it is science. And so it wasn't just like handing them law. Here's all the things you should do. There was immediate debate on what do these laws mean because of the way that they were given to them, the way that they were expressed. And then in Deuteronomy, it's reinterpreted for a new gen generation. Um, and then there's a period of time that's represented, if you have a physical Bible, um, by usually like one page between Malachi and Matthew. And during this time, it represents like 400 years, the, this, there's this rise of this group called the Pharisees. And they take the law and dust it off, and they decide to reinterpret it again and give way more context to it. I mean, it becomes this overly overwhelming, cumbersome thing that essentially nobody could live up to. And then lastly, Jesus, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, and then continuing on in his gospel ministry, he continues to expand on, to reinterpret, to show them what the law actually means. And then beyond that, Jews have continued to do this. So um, beyond those four that I just mentioned, there's also the Mishnah, which is a, 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 an even deeper reinterpretation of the Torah. And then there's the Talmud, which is an interpretation of the interpretation of the Mishnah. The thing that, that, that Jews have done extremely well for their entire existence that we could learn a lot from is debating and interpreting. Debating and interpreting. Argumentation isn't considered a threat Argumentation isn't considered something where somebody's sort of trying to dismantle your, um, your way of thinking, but rather an, an appropriate and healthy challenge to the status quo. We have a lot to learn from the way that they've interpreted the law and the Bible, the Old Testament, in their particular case. And to this day, Jews continue to debate and interpret and reinterpret, and this is why. There are so many parts of the law that aren't that can't be received at face value. They have to be considered. They have to be meditated on. I'm going to give you an example right now from our teaching text. In verse 31 of chapter 5, it goes like this. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, this is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 24, which is a much longer explanation of this particular 
verse, and in it, Jesus is reinterpreting this Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, there are at least, or, sorry, in this particular, sorry, it, let me go back to Deuteronomy 24 really quick. In the very first verse, what it says is, a man can divorce his wife if he finds anything undesirable in her. Anything undesirable at all. It is appropriate for him to divorce her. That's our English translation, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Now, there are at least two things offensive about this, okay? There's at least two things that are making you squirm in your seat, right? I can see you. Um, I'm just going to, maybe it's just like end it right here and just let you keep, I'm just kidding. Two things you find offensive. Um, the first is we are bothered by the fact that men are 100% in charge of whether or not a marriage sust is sustained or ended. We're bothered by that. Women don't seem to have a say at all. And more about this in a second. I'll get to that in one minute. But the next thing that offends is the fact that in the English translation, in this law, women can be divorced for any reason whatsoever if they are in some way undesirable. Bad breath, divorce. Doesn't laugh at jokes, divorce. Doesn't appreciate the masterful performance of Colin Farrell's eyebrows and the banshees of Inner Sheeran, divorce. That was my joke from last week. Um, we take issue with that. And we should take issue with that. And here's why. You take issue with that because you are formed and shaped by the way and teachings of Jesus. Jesus took issue with it too, which is why he reinterprets it for a modern context in the Sermon on the Mount. There's a reason for that. You feel that for a really good reason. You feel that for a really, really good reason. And I have good news for you. On the first offense, Moses was interpreting the law for a patriarchal culture, which our modern context is moving away from. Jesus' culture had not yet, which is why he maintains that same bit about men divorcing women. Jesus is trying to make a particular point here about why this might happen or how this might go, come about. He's not fighting the battle of patriarchy, patriarchy at the moment. That would have served as a massive distraction. So Jesus is moving right past that rather quickly to make his point, which isn't about who, it's about how. There's nothing... There's nothing in these interpretations that indicates the spirit of the law can't or shouldn't expand to include women. Moreover, if you continue to read Deuteronomy chapter 24, you'll see that this particular law was in place to protect women. It was, it was, in, it was in place to keep women from becoming this commodity that was passed around as though they were cheap property. That was the whole point of Deuteronomy chapter 24. On the second offense, our English translation for Deuteronomy 24 sucks. All of them. And it's not because the translators are bad at their job. They're doing the best they can to do a word-for-word -word translation. And the fact is, the word for undesirable needs paragraphs to explain. Because again, the Hebrew language isn't science. You can't just do a one-for-one -one translation into the English language. There's a tremendous amount of explanation. And to this day, Jews debate what this particular word means. It's a Hebrew turn of phrase, and literally, it's nakedness. And the Pharisees confront Jesus about it in Matthew chapter 19. And it specifically says that they're there to trap him. Like they've got a hypothesis that this guy's a heretic, and they're going to test the hypothesis, and they're going to trap him because they're going to say, hey, you know this word that we've been debating for like hundreds of years? Um, what do you think about it? And they're convinced they have the right interpretation, and so he's going to get himself into a mess. Well, Jesus doesn't and totally owns him. It's a really cool chapter. You should read it at some point. But for us, for our sake, this phrase is debated. It's not clear cut. It's not an easy translation. So Jesus shows up, Sermon on the Mount, and he says, here's my translation. Here's my explanation. This nakedness is referring to sexual immorality. When there is some kind of unfaithfulness, and of course this would be expanded on again over time, even in Jesus' ministry, to mean unfaithfulness in either direction, the divorce would be an appropriate thing, or an appropriate response. But what Jesus is saying here is that it's not if your wife does anything undesirable ever. It's this specific kind of offense. Again, Jesus raises the bar on relationships. And this keeps happening time and time again in all of these texts throughout chapter 5 and even beyond into 6 and 7. We see Jesus raising the bar on relationships and saying there is more of us required than was originally given to us because we take the law we transcend it, and we include it. We reinterpret it. We debate it. We discuss it and talk about what, how it fits into our particular modern context. And so now I want to talk again. I want to zoom back in on this durability of relationships because Jesus goes point by point and talks about relationships that are under threat of fragility 
and he adds to them layers that gives us a sense that relationships could and should be durable. Our relationships should be able to withstand some of the difficulties um, that we have experienced over the last several years. Disposability benefits people in power. Disposability doesn't confront the status quo. It allows for the status quo to continue, and Jesus turns that on its head, creates a system that is more equitable by suggesting durability in relationships. So what are the things that cause a wedge in relationships? Think about that for a second. Think about a relationship that you have where there is some sort of a wedge. And I want to take just a minute here and create just a little caveat conversation. I'm not referring to relationships in which there are there is abuse. I'm not, th- in this conversation here, this isn't a like, you know, if you've been in an abusive relationship and that's created separation, you should definitely get back into that relationship. That's not the point of this. That's a different conversation for a different time in a different context. But think about a relationship that you have or have had where there was a wedge, where there was some sort of distance, there was some sort of fragility, where it wasn't able to stand, withstand some of the difficulties we've experienced over the last couple of years. Think about that and keep that in mind as we keep going. Best I can tell, over the last couple of years, there are three threats that have been posed to the durability of our relationships. The first is this, suspicion. Everything and everyone in our life and in our experiences is more sus to us now than they were a few years ago. And to some extent, that's okay. Like, think about the way that your reptilian brain is designed to work, right? Your suspicious nature about any person or anything or any system or whatever is designed to keep you safe. But that's been on overdrive over the last couple of years, and we consider everything around us suspicious. And that's caused us to do a couple of things. First of all, it's caused us to create distance between us and existing relationships. The other thing it's caused us to do is to question whether or not we could enter into new relationships. And so some of you in this room, whether you realize it or not, have not been able to get to know somebody else in this room or get to know somebody else in your neighborhood or get to know somebody else at work because you're approaching them from a position of suspicion. Verses 21 through 26 in Matthew 5 is all about rage and hate. It's expanding the idea and definition of marriage, ra- or sorry, uh, murder, raising, raising the bar and expanding it on this particular law to help people understand that rage and hate are buds of seeds of suspicion. These are the buds on the seeds of suspicion. When we have suspicion in our heart, suspicion in our relationships, they bud and grow and turn into rage and hate oftentimes. There's a movie out right now on Netflix called You People. Uh, I've only re- watched like half of it, so I'm no expert on the movie. But every single relationship in the first half of the movie, at least, is based in suspicion. Every single relationship is based on, I, th- this, I can't trust this person. This is going to be a problem. Every conversation is like, this is going to be a massive disaster. Uh, this isn't a spoiler at all. All the conversations are massive disasters. That's, that's kind of the point of the movie. But the suspicion that goes into those conversations and those relationships is very characteristic of the suspicion that we carry with us today. Suspicion is the seed. It's the root. It's the beginning part of rage and hate and so many things that have come to characterize our relationships in this particular time in our lives. Second thing um, that I I find to be a threat to our relationships in general are pseudo-relationships or virtual relationships. Now, I, I'm going to talk for just a second on, like, social media and just sort of the effect that that has had on us. I am not a, I mean, I, well, I am kind of an old curmudgeon, but um, I don't mean to be in this particular sense uh, because I think that, that all things have their place. I think that social media have their place. I think the way that we date and form new relationships now have their place. I can't remember, other than Maggie and Zach's wedding, I don't think, I can't remember the last wedding I did that, um, where the people hadn't met on some sort of an online, like, social platform in some way, okay? Because that's just common. That's just typical now, and that's fine. But oftentimes, that spills over into us believing that a pseudo-relationship is a real relationship. Sometimes, our social media-based relationships, that person that you think is either your friend or your enemy on Twitter, is not actually a relationship, but you think that it is. And so we've replaced real relationships with pseudo-relationships, In verses 27 through uh, 32, lust is brought up as an important way for us to be warned about these pseudo-relationships. Lust is a virtual form of intimacy. So uh, we immediately go to like sex and sexuality. That's like kind of the way that we think about lust. But if you could expand lust for just a minute to, to include any form of intimacy, a virtual form of intimacy is a threat to real intimacy. 
pseudo-intimacy is a threat to real intimacy. And so what, what Jesus is warning us against is something that's still really valid here 2,000 years later, that we wouldn't let these pseudo-relationships come in place of our real relationships, that they wouldn't drive a wedge into our real relationships, and we would see them for what they are, and that we would be able to interact with them for what they are. Again, they aren't bad in and of themselves, but when we are satisfied with them as they are in a pseudo or virtual format, we fail to experience the depth of a relationship. We fail to get to the point where a relationship is actually vulnerable. We fail to get to that point where a relationship maybe doesn't always match up all the time and experience perfect alignment, and we have to muscle through it. We have to experience durability. This becomes a source of fragility and disposability in our relationships. And lastly, there's a lot of self-centeredness in our relationships. Something that has happened over the last couple of years has been sort of the rise of self-care culture. And I've talked about this before, and I have to, like, tread lightly here because I, I, I think that because for generations we have not taken care of ourselves, this is extremely important, that we learn to take care of ourselves. But one of the things that is oftentimes devoid, or, or uh, that our self-care conversations are devoid of, is any conversation about self-sacrifice. You see, there's relationships that Jesus is talking about throughout the Sermon on the Mount and in other teachings that he has are, are filled with self-sacrifice. And that is, again, that doesn't mean that if you're in some sort of an abusive, codependent, toxic relationship that I, you should just, like, keep self-sacrifice. That's not my point, okay? And I'm not saying that you have to sacrifice self-care in order to be self-sacrificial in a relationship. That's not it at all. But sometimes because in the name of boundary setting or in the name of self-care or in the name of this or that, whatever term we want to use, we fail to see the opportunity to sacrifice for someone else. To get off our high horse and to practice some humility and say, yeah, I'm going to inconvenience myself for this person's sake because our relationship is more durable than how I'm hap I happen to be feeling today. A relationship has some durability in verses 38 through 48. There's a, there are a couple different, like, stories that Jesus tells. The one that we think about the most is the turn the other cheek story. Uh, you know, if a person strikes you on your right cheek, turn to them and, and offer them your left. But there's another story right after that about going the extra mile, literally. We use that term, but it literally comes from this text where if somebody asks you to go one mile or um, asks you to go a certain distance, you say, yeah, I'll go a little farther, actually. I'm willing to sacrifice my comfort, my time, whatever currency that I happen to have for your sake because I love you. My guess is as we've been going through this today, there have been a few things that have come to your mind. And my hope is that at the very least, a person has come to your mind. It could be a spouse. It could be one of your kids. It could be a roommate. It could be a coworker. It could be a neighbor. It could be some, I mean, anybody. But I'm guessing somebody has come to your mind at some point where you feel as though the relationship has experienced some fragility or experienced some distance. And maybe with the words of Jesus here that are certainly challenging, as he raises the bar, you can find some durability in that relationship with some effort and work. Our relationships as followers of the way of Jesus should be some of the healthiest around because we have great teaching on how relationships could be healthy. We're not just sort of wandering around doing the best we can. We have this incredible teaching that helps us understand how relationships are supposed to be under the banner of God, under the family of God. My hope is that our relationships in our church, even though we're kind of a drop in the bucket in the whole like, kingdom of God, that we would represent healthy relationships. Relationships where, that are real and not pseudo. Relationships where there's trust, not suspicion. And relationships where there's self-sacrifice and willingness to give ourselves to each other. These are relationships formed in the way of Jesus. There's plenty more to say, and I'm just going to like leave the kind of this last part off, so don't worry about putting it on the screen, Samuel. But... Um, I would love for you to consider this. What does Jesus expect from your relationships? When Jesus raises the bar and expands the law to help us understand what these relationships are, when he says, you've heard it said, but I say, what does that mean for you in your actual real relationships? It could be the person sitting next to you or behind you. It may be somebody that you don't actually know in this room because you haven't been able to, you know, cross the aisle, if you will, <laughs> and talk to them. But what if that changes today? Again, relationships in the way of Jesus look different. They just look different. There's a durability to them and a willingness and an opportunity to withstand difficulty, hardship, and fragility. Let's pray. God, thanks for, um, well, we covered like the whole Bible today. Thank you for all of it. 
Um, and we're just grateful that you've given it to us as mysterious and weird and sometimes perplexing as it is. It's also this incredible gift that we get to keep interpreting and reinterpreting, and I pray that that would be the lens by which we approach it. Um, thank you, God, for all the things you've given us. We love you. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.